God, laying your majesty aside. You reach down in love to show me life. Lifted from darkness into light. Oh, King for a slave, trading your righteousness for shame. Despite all my pride and foolish ways Caught in your infinite embrace oh, And I find myself here on my knees again Caught up in grace like an avalanche Nothing compares to this love, love, love burning in my heart. The body enters into theology through the main door. Now, that's kind of a complex idea, but what that's based on is this idea is, is that Jesus' incarnation refers to how it is that God himself desired so much to communicate his love to us that he actually took on our humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation refers to how it is that God, if you will, clothed himself with our humanity, united our humanity with his divinity in the person of Jesus. He is perfectly divine, perfectly God, and perfectly man at the same time. This is a great mystery, but it's one of the truths of our faith and allows us to see something very important about the person of Jesus. And that is, is that in the person of Jesus, God has actually given us a bridge between heaven and earth. And so in the context of this theology of the body, we see the importance of the body. The body not only becomes a bridge between heaven and earth, it becomes our bridge, if you will, our connection to Christ himself. St. Paul says we're baptized into his body, and this becomes the basis of his theology of the mystical body of Christ. We are mystically united to Jesus because of our baptism. And St. Paul describes that mystical body as being composed of Jesus as the head and the rest of us as the members of his body. 
And it's only, it's only with this background, this basic understanding of the incarnation of Jesus' body being a bridge between heaven and earth, and how it is that our baptism unites us mystically to Him, that we can have a window of insight into the meaning and the purpose of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now, how many of us think the Mass, if we're going, is boring? Now, our generation, my generation, is so used to sitting down, watching something, and we expect to be entertained. So we sit, we watch, we got video games, we got concerts, we got the iPads, we got the iPhones. We sit, we watch, and we expect to be entertained. But the Mass has been developed in a way, not necessarily to give us a form of entertainment. I mean, God gave us enough forms of entertainment. The Mass has been developed in a way to participate in relationship with God. First of all, especially when I was younger, the only reason why I was going to Mass was because my parents were making me go to Mass. And all I really cared about was what time the Giants were playing. So what would happen? Mass would begin. God started pouring out His life and love. But what was I doing? I'm thinking the Giants are playing at 4 o'clock. I'm thinking about what happened during the weekend or what's going on next week. When I got older, I'd go and I'd receive the Eucharist and I'd walk out that back door because I fulfilled my Sunday obligation. When I was old enough to drive, I'd go to Mass. I'd grab a Bolton. I'd go to the mall. I'd go home. I'd be like, look, Mom and Dad, I went to Mass. Is there any relationship going on between me and God? No, of course we're bored. In the relationship aspect of the Mass, if you don't put anything into the relationship, you're not going to get anything that much out of the relationship. If I'm on a blind date with a girl, if I'm not hearing what she's saying, understanding it, and having some type of conversation back, there's not going to be a second date. Your relationship with God, your Mass experience will change. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes time, just like getting to know someone takes time. So we've got two beings. We've got these two beings, God and man, who are meant to participate in relationship with God. And the Mass has been developed in a way to participate in relationship with God. So see what God is doing here. God, who is pure love, is pouring out His life and love to all humanity. He wants all of humanity to receive His life and love and accept it. He wants that life and love to grow with inside of us, and He wants us to pour forth that life and love back to Himself and to the whole world. God reveals the greatness of His love uh, to us and for us in the most powerful way. The background of this liturgy of the Holy Eucharist is the background of the whole of Revelation. The whole of the Bible uh, its bookends, if you will, uh, is written under the umbrella and under the symbol, if you will, of marriage and matrimony. At the beginning in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of creation, the story of God's revelation, the revelation of His love for us, begins with a couple in the garden who are united in marriage. At the end of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, we also have uh, a marriage, but in this case, the marriage that the book of Revelation describes is a marriage between Christ and his spouse, the church. The book of Revelation was written by Saint John the Evangelist. He's taken up into, in spirit and he's given a mystical vision, a window into heaven itself. And in this mystical vision, this experience of looking and peering into the great mysteries of heaven, he sees two things. The first thing is, is that John sees that what's going on in heaven is that God is perpetually and forever being worshipped and adored by the angels and saints uh, and holy persons who have gone before John, who have died and gone to heaven. And that this worship takes, takes um, that this worship happens in the context of a liturgy. That what John sees in this worship are elements that parallel um, our own worship of God in the, in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. John sees um, the angels worshiping God, crying out to Him, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God, which is something uh, that we do in the very context of the Mass when we, when we pray the Holy, Holy, Holy or the Sanctus. John sees uh, the angels wearing white linen, just like um, the ministers and the priests 
uh, in the liturgy of the Mass where he sees candles, he sees incense, right? And so all of these things, including the, the golden chalices, remind us of the holy celebration of the liturgy of the Eucharist. What John is seeing in heaven is a holy liturgy, if you will, that models and is parallel to the liturgy that we celebrate in the Mass. So the first thing that John experiences when he has this opportunity, this mystical vision to peer into heaven, is he sees the heavenly liturgy going on. The second thing, John sees um, the bride, the bride. In Revelation chapter 12, the bride of the Lamb is revealed. And this is very powerful because the word revelation in Greek, the original Greek word for revelation is apocalypsis. In the Old Testament, the apocalypsis um, signified or, or referred to the unveiling of the bride. When a bride was married to her groom, in the context of the marriage celebration, um, the bride would be revealed and her veil will be, was pulled back just prior to the consummation of their marriage in the marital embrace, their sexual union. When John peers into heaven, he also sees an apocalypsis. He sees a bride that is revealed, but in all of the, the symbology of the book of Revelation, the bride that it is that's revealed is revealed to be the church. So let's remain focused and we'll, we'll carry on going through these songs and then maybe at the end we'll have the chance to go through each one of them, top to bottom. Um, the Gospel Lights. The book of Revelation is split almost uh, directly into it. The book of Revelation has a total of 22 chapters. And in the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation, um, there are many things going on, but the focus of those first 11 chapters is um, what is likened unto a liturgy of the Word. The celebration of the Mass can also be broken up into two sections what we call the Liturgy of the Word, where we hear God's Word proclaimed to us. The Holy Scriptures are proclaimed to us. And the second half of the Mass um, is the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, where we offer thanks to God, but we also receive uh, Jesus Himself in Holy Communion. And so there is a similar division that we can discern in the book of Revelation. The first 11 chapters talk about how it is that uh, in heaven there is a scroll with seals connected on it. And um, John uh, laments that there is no one who is worthy, there is no one who can open the seals of the scroll um, until it is that Christ himself appears. And Jesus, who is considered worthy, is able to break open the seals of the scroll that have, been, have remained sealed for, from all ages. And he comes and he opens the seals and he breaks open the scroll and this um, is emblematic, it's symbolic of how it is that Jesus is the one who is the key to the whole of Revelation, the whole of Scripture, that it's only by seeing Scripture in and through the lens of Jesus Christ that the whole story makes sense. From the beginning in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament to the end of the book of Revelation, 
The whole story is a story of God's plan to come and to save mankind. And that the way that he did it, the, whole, the way that the whole story fits together, that we're able to see the connection of them all, is in and through the lens of Christ. In the second half of the book of Revelation, um, we see that holy liturgy that we were talking about earlier. When we said that John peered into heaven and he, he saw the worship of God being conducted uh, in the context of a holy liturgy, a liturgy that modeled that of our celebration of the Mass, um, we see that the second half of the book of Revelation is also uh, mirroring, if you will, the second half of the Mass. And just as um, the book of Revelation culminates in the wedding feast of the bride and the bridegroom, the Lamb, uh, so also does the liturgy of the Mass. When we receive Holy Communion, we are receiving Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we who are the Church, we are described by St. Paul as the Bride of Christ. And so in Holy Communion, in a way that is analogous to the one flesh union of bride and bridegroom, we are united. Um, our souls are espoused to Jesus Christ himself. Um, through the Holy Eucharist, which is the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, we are united in a one flesh union that is likened unto that um, of the one flesh union of bride and bridegroom. The consummation that occurs between the Bride, the Church, and Christ, the Heavenly Lamb, isn't described in sexual terms. It's described as a heavenly wedding feast, a heavenly wedding feast. And so when John looks into heaven and he sees these two things, first of all, the heavenly liturgy, and second of all, the revelation of the Bride in Revelations 12, and the consummation of their marriage bond. In the, um, in the celebration of the wedding feast, John is revealing to us that in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that we, the Church, are the Bride, and in the sacrifice of the Mass, especially when we receive Holy Communion, we, the Bride, the Church, are mystically espoused to um, our Holy Spouse, Jesus Christ Himself, when it is that we receive Holy Communion. And so John's revelation shows us how great God's love is for us and how it is that in the, the, the holy book of God's word to us from beginning to end, from the book of Genesis and finally the book of Revelation, that God's love for us is described um, in spousal terms, in mystical terms, uh, in a mystical marriage. And this reveals to us that God's love for us is both intimate and lasting. Uh, and that he loves us and, and invites us into a relationship that is intimate, even as intimate of, as the relationship between a husband uh, and um, his bride.
Right? God, God creates humanity, and not only creates humanity, but literally wants to pour out his life and love to humanity. What does the priest say when he raises up the host? This is my body which will be given up for you. God is pouring out his life and love to humanity. In order for relationship to continue, what does man have to do? Well, just like in the dating relationship, we have to say yes. We have to receive God's life and love. And do, when do we receive God's life and love? First and foremost, in baptism, but then every single time we participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, we are literally, we, we, every time we receive that little white host, we are literally receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, life and love itself. But here's the clinch. In order for that relationship to continue, what does man have to do? We've got to give ourselves back to God. Well, the more time you spend with someone, the more you get to know someone. And the Mass has been developed in a way to participate in relationship with God. Nothing compares to this love 